you to this chat. And uh, yes, uh, I'm from Pakistan, and we have a bomb, uh, which is uh, which is our bomb, and that's the topic of uh, this little thing that I've written. Our bomb. Our bomb isn't just a weapon constructed in a nuclear lab by a bunch of overqualified scientists. It's an extension of our foundational myth. The myth involves a German-trained metallurgist, Dr. Abdul Qadir, who became a national hero for a while and still calls himself the father of the bomb. It involved a popular prime minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who pledged, we shall make our bomb even if we have to eat grass. It involved a military dictator, General Ziaul Haq, who was very close to the United States. And the United States kept asking him, we hope you're not building the bomb. And he would always answer, bomb? What bomb? Of course, the American knew, but they needed him for their proxy wars. So they looked the other way while we very quietly begged, borrowed, and stole to build our bomb. It involved another prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, who risked international isolation, refused offers of billions of dollars of aid if he didn't explode the bomb, but he went ahead and exploded the bomb. India had carried out four nuclear tests. Pakistan said it had carried out six. We made it sound like a game of amateur football. Bhutto, the man who promised to eat grass to make the bomb, was hanged after a farcical trial. He had come to power promising a socialist Pakistan. Bread, house, and clothes for everyone. In his wake, he left religious bigotry and the seeds of the bomb. The man who hanged him ruled the country for 11 years. General Ziaul Haq started a multinational jihad industry with his Saudi, American, and European friends. He kept saying to his last day that he was not making the bomb, and if he did actually make the bomb, it will be for peaceful purposes. He never elaborated on that peaceful purpose. His plane blew up in the midair, killing seven top generals, the US ambassador to Pakistan. We never bothered to find out who killed him. We quietly continued our work to make our bomb. The man, Nawaz Sharif, who finally scored six explosions to India's four, was forced into exile after he turned Pakistan into a nuclear power. He came back from the exile, reminded people that he had made the bomb, he was elected the prime minister again, and as I speak, he's back in jail on corruption charges. His supporters still remind us that here, look, here was the man who made the bomb, and you have put him in jail. The bomb that he made couldn't in the end save his political career. And the father of the bomb, the metallurgist, something quite embarrassing happened to him which would be a cautionary tale for anyone who takes pride in having fathered a bomb. At some point, the world found out that not only we have been making our own bombs, we have been giving tutorials to some countries like North Korea and Iran about how to make your own bomb. It was alleged that we sold them our nuclear secrets along with some bits and bobs that go into making the bomb. The government decided to dump the whole thing on the good doctor. Dr. Abdul Qadir was made to appear on national television, and in a confession, he admitted that he had been peddling our nuclear wares around the globe. He said he was ashamed of himself. He asked for nation's forgiveness. Of course, he couldn't have done it all on his own. Later, he declared that he was forced to confess at gunpoint and he confessed in order to save the country's honor to secure our nuclear assets. He writes a weekly column for a newspaper now in which he never forgets to remind his readers that he 
is the sole father of our bomb. If Dr. Abdul Qadir is indeed the father of the bomb, then who is the mother, you might wonder. I think we, the people of Pakistan, are because in this painful birthing process, we have suffered the most, we have bled. Pakistan's nuclear program was conceived a year after the country's breakup, a trauma so intense that we have almost erased it from our memory. At the time of its independence, Pakistan had two parts, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. In the middle was the enemy, India. East Pakistan won its freedom and became Bangladesh. We've tried for generations to forget the whole thing, and we've been quite successful. My son was in class 10 when he came back from school one day and asked me, did Bangladesh used to be part of Pakistan? He had apparently stumbled across this national secret while reading a Bangladeshi novel. I said, yes, and he said, it seemed like a very bad idea. One country, two wings, separated by the enemy country. It might have seemed like a bright idea at the time, but it ended in bloodshed. Pakistan suffered its ultimate humiliation when after decades of misrule and a world-class massacre in East Pakistan, our arch enemy, India, intervened and 90,000 strong Pakistan army surrendered in Dhaka. Its celebrated soldier became prisoners of war. Our eastern brother declared its independence. Pakistani elite, which had fed its population stories of our own martial prowess, found it hard to live with the fact that our old enemy had inflicted a fatal wound on us. One day we were allowed to rule them, take their produce and their women, and kill their poets, and then they said, enough of this now. We are free now. We fought you. Sure, India fought along us, but guess what happened? We've won our freedom, and you have lost. And, we, and you have 90,000 of your brave soldiers in Indian prisons. Good luck and goodbye. An agreement of sorts was signed with India, and our soldiers returned. Pakistan, grudgingly, very grudgingly, accepted that its other half, and many would say much better half, was an independent state now. After the grudging acceptance, the fear that if India could do it once, what's there to stop India from doing it again? Soon after, Pakistan army soldiers had returned home from their ordeals in Indian prisons, India carried out its first nuclear test. Enemy had made its intentions clear. Enemy, enemy was on its way to develop the instrument of our total humiliation. This was our moment to pledge to eat grass and make our bomb. Between that moment of pledging to eat grass and 25 years later, when Pakistan went public by testing its nuclear bomb, a series of myths surrounded Pakistan's nuclear mission. At least, some of these myths were perpetuated to boost our fragile egos. When the West declared that Pakistan's nuclear program was an attempt to build an Islamic bomb, instead of asserting that no, it was our own, we rejoice that finally we were Muslim Ummah's undisputed protector. It fed into our narratives about our promise to liberate Kashmir, Afghanistan, Palestine, and even Chechnya. Kashmir has been brought, brutalized by both the nuclear powers, India and Pakistan. Because they can't eliminate each other because of that damn bomb, they can't go to war, which will put everyone out of their misery, they ramp up the local atrocities. If we can't fire up that nuclear bomb, surely we can keep blinding the Kashmiri kids. We can keep abducting our own citizens and shooting them in the head because everybody knows we have the bomb. You don't mess with someone who has the bomb. India and Pakistan might have found their freedom 72 years ago, but our bombs have really freed us up. We can carpet bomb, torture, produce terrorists, hide Osama bin Laden, 
in the end, what's the world going to do? It's going to shake its head and say, we hope your nukes are safe. It doesn't bother us that none of the people we set out to liberate, people in Kashmir, in Palestine, in China, in Chechnya, they're not any closer to their respective ideas of freedom. We finally have ensured ours, but at what cost? We are not quite eating grass, but we are severely malnourished. 18 million of our children will never see the inside of a school. Here's a random list of things that we haven't been able to do because we were too busy making that damn bomb and hiding it from the world's eyes. We've not been able to eliminate polio, but thank God we have the bomb. We still haven't figured out how to provide clean drinking water to our people. Quarter of a million people die because of waterborne diseases, but thank God our enemy can't touch us because we have the bomb. Our beaches are littered with plastic waste. Our air has turned poison because we have so many cars all stuck in a massive traffic jam. We have children on the streets, children so young that they have forgotten that they were put there to beg. They forget and they start playing with stray cats. Those poor souls can't take comfort in the fact that we have the bomb. They may not know, but we, the educated types, know that there's a big, bad world out there and that world can't touch us because we have, our, we have our bomb. It gives us power to think like a superpower. How many nuclear powers are there in the world? We are one of you. You can bully us on the playground all you want, but you can't hit us because you know that we've got the same bomb that you have. And one of you has actually used it twice. And we've heard all the defense and anal analysts saying that the second time, it wasn't really needed. Hiroshima was enough. But someone decided the first one looked so spectacular and was so hugely successful, why the hell not drop another one? Although we love our bomb, sometimes we think that our bomb hasn't quite given us the all-encompassing protection we needed. We've taken 60,000 60, casualties in the so-called war against domestic and external terror in the past 15 years. We can hardly use the bomb against the men hiding in our own cities, blowing up our own citizens. Sure, as soon as there is scare on our borders with India, there are sleepless nights in Western capitals because of our bombs. Seasoned diplomats rush back and forth between Delhi and Islamabad trying to calm our nerves. And we do usually calm down because we are as responsible as you are. And no, we are not attention seekers. An American academic, a very serious one, the kind who make a career out of studying and then insulting one country once said that Pakistan negotiates with the world by holding a gun to its own head. That's mildly racist, but also a bit inaccurate. We don't hold a gun to our head. We have a bomb in the attic, just like you do. There's always this fear, and we like that the world has this fear about us, that if we feel an existential threat to our country, we might use our bomb, just like one of you did twice over. There's an even bigger fear, though, that someone might steal our bomb and use it against us or our friends or our enemies Western countries like spreading this fear. Every few months, there's a think tank report or a newspaper analysis which asks, is Pakistan's nuclear arsenal safe? Can rogue elements get access to our weapons? Can one of our many enemies destroy our bomb? How do you even steal a nuclear bomb? We know it happens in the movies all the time, but this is real life. How do you destroy a nuclear bomb? On this, we are all united. Those who love the bomb and those who feel squeamish about it. We all agree that our bomb is as safe as your bomb. It's actually safer than any bomb in the world. 
Many refer to our capital, Islamabad, as that place 70 kilometers from Pakistan's nuclear facilities. They don't know what they're talking about. We can't really tell anybody, let alone our own citizens, how safe our bomb is and the pains we've taken to make it safe. If we told you how we made it safe, then what would be the point? We play this schoolyard game, our bomb is bigger than yours, our bomb is safer than yours. Sometimes the doubters among us wonder if this is the only nuclear deterrence in the world which instead of protecting us needs our protection. In a perverse kind of way, we are always pledging to protect our nuclear weapons. It seems we don't really feel like the owner of the ultimate destructive power, but like a poor widow who has got only one family jewel and who believes that everybody is out to rob her. But we assure ourselves that all the safeguards are in place. We have pledged to safeguard the bomb. It's as sacred as our own land. The nuclear tests were carried out in a mountain range called Chagi. India had done it in a place called Pokhran. We used to celebrate the bomb day, the day we exploded the bomb. The day the bomb exploded, the mountain turned white. We used to build up little models of the newly turned white mountain and display it on the day of the bomb. This is to remind ourselves of our sacred duty to stand guard over the bomb. Some of us who don't love the bomb as much as they should wonder if the bomb has really made us safe. They seem to think that it has definitely made those people secure who intend to harm our neighbors and sometimes our own people as well. Nobody's going to come after them because they are operating from, from a sovereign country with a bomb. And we keep reminding the world that we will use this bomb if our sovereignty is threatened. Because like every other country, we've got some bad eggs, some in control, some out of control. Some help us with our sovereignty, others think that they are the sovereigns. Sometimes we have to stretch the definition of sovereignty in order to keep our bomb safe. We are still not sure if it was Osama bin Laden who violated our, our sovereignty by taking refuge here, or the Americans who barged in one night and killed him and took away his body. Sovereignty is a complex notion. Our bomb is much simpler. Let's keep it that way. This simplicity was channeled by one of our most influential media moguls who said that his last wish was to be tied to our bomb and dropped over India. He died of old age a couple of years ago, but his dream lives on. Even if our bomb can't save us from our daily mayhem, it can definitely teach India a lesson, even if that lesson means mutual annihilation. It's like a suicide pact amongst lovers. You in the West had the bomb much before us, and you haven't tried very hard that other people, you have tried very hard that other people shouldn't have it because they're too poor, too volatile, they won't know how to take care of the bomb. You come up with flight plans that you send to the world, and then you make drones that can deliver pizza or maybe a small nuclear device. Let's pause for a moment and think, who really is crazy here? Those who are rich and who have a bomb, or those who are poor, poor and still insist on having a bomb? Are you saying that my bomb made me poor and your bomb made you richer. Did I say that we are not quite eating grass? Yes, we aren't, but there was this one time. We were told that both uh, India and Pakistan had the bomb, so we'll never be able to go to war unless, of course, one of us decided that life is too tough and let's rid each other of this miserable planet. But in 1999, we went to war again. There's a high mountain range called Kargil on India-Pakistan borders. Pakistani generals, in their infinite wisdom, occupied the peaks and started shelling Indian army posts. They thought India will panic 
and we'll cut them off from Kashmir. When India screamed war, Pakistan said, no, no, it's just a bunch of civilians who want to liberate Kashmir. India retaliated, and Kargil turned into a full-fledged war zone with fighter jets and flag-draped coffins. When two nuclear powers go to war, usually there's panic, there are, there's panic in the White House and some other major capitals of the world. The world intervened and a ceasefire was agreed. Supplies were cut off, armies retreated, and when they started to clear the area, they found the bodies of the soldiers who had died, not in the battle, not because of gunfire or rocket missiles, but because of starvation. And when post-mortems were conducted, they found grass in their stomachs. So although we do have our bomb to protect us from our neighbor's bomb, but we are sometimes forced to eat grass in a fated attempt to stay alive. Thank you. Thank you for a powerfully disturbing talk. As you were speaking, I was actually wondering how much would have to be changed to um, apply to the richest country that has a number of, uh, you know, has a larger nuclear arsenal because um, it's actually a Pakistani, Malala Yousafzai, yeah. who pointed out that uh, we could educate every child in the world mm. for 12 years. I don't know if you heard this speech. Mm. Every child in the world for 12 years on the profits made by the arms industry in eight days, uh, which is a statistic that I actually checked with um, uh, a very famous economist, and mm. he did a couple of figures, and he said, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, it's one that I keep repeating because I have no idea what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me it should be in the forefront of our minds. Mm -hmm. um, how would this talk, and of course, you know, even, even if um, you may not find grass in the stomachs of children in the Mississippi Delta, there's uh, serious hunger mm -hmm. in many parts of the United States as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how this talk would play in Pakistan. That was the other question that was on my mind as you were speaking. Uh, this is not a good week to have that conversation in Pakistan. Because <laughs> we are on the brink of war with India yet again. We kind of do it every couple of times. We're probably the worst neighbors, the worst couple in the world, like, uh, you know. So no, I was uh, just before I left Karachi three days ago, there was a government minister on, on TV, and he was saying, he was comparing this bomb to, like, have you seen those fireworks? What's that thing called, sparkler, that you hold and kind of, you know, it kind of gives out? Yeah, so he's saying that our kind of what we have, he called it a sparkler. So we are not saving it for some festivity. So don't, you know, sort of take us uh, uh, lightly. So mm, we've had uh, uh, these kind of conversations uh, in Pakistan before. But as I said, this is uh, not a, a, a good week when kind of, you know, the war drums are kind of, you know, uh, sort of sounding high on, on both sides. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's best to kind of uh, shut up for a few days <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise these things can have uh, 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 consequences. We've had these conversations uh, in the past. There was a big debate before actually Pakistan went uh, nuclear. And, uh, you know, there were some sane people saying that this is uh, absolutely uh, uh, nuts. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, because 
what we were promised was that if we have a, this protection, then surely we can cut down slash our defense budget, right? And you know, we won't need like such a huge army, we won't need, <laughs> but of course, every, every year, the defense budget keeps uh, going uh, up and keeps eating into like, you know, with little things like education and, and, and you know, and health. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously it's kind of, uh, which is difficult to talk about in Pakistan, actually it doesn't protect its citizens, it protects the radicals because, <laughs> because they are operating from here. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so yeah, not, not, not a good week in Pakistan for, for this conversation. Can I ask if, um, if you say this happens every couple of years? India, Pakistan? Yeah. Yeah, it's fairly I, I mean, I, mm. it's mm. not the conflicts that I follow the most, but mm. even for somebody who doesn't follow it, it mm. does seem to come up on a regular basis. Mm. Um, what, um, what effect does that have? Does it, I mean, there are countries in which people simply get used to uh, rumors of war and shrug it off and that would lead to the kinds of uh, the kind of atmosphere that Martin had in mind in, in calling this workshop namely mm. it, nobody takes it seriously anymore mm. is that the case or or do you, is is there a sense I mean obviously the bomb mm. is if your paper reflects anything, mm. um, you know, about the culture, mm. it obviously plays a larger role in general cultural consciousness mm -hmm. than it does in some of the other nuclear powers. Mm -hmm. But is it something that people worry about or is it uh, that again? Uh, let me... Yeah, I think even the sort of... Uh, uh, the world used to worry until, like you know, till I think, till 2006 or 2008 when when the Bombay attacks happened. So right. there was like you know, every wise man in DC and kind of Europe was kind of shuttling between Islamabad and Delhi and trying to. But uh, but I think they've they've got bold with it. <laughs> so like they are they are at it with such uh, such uh, regularity. If they want to kind of you know uh, do it, let them just. Uh, uh, get on with it. I haven't noticed like any any activity for the last uh, week since since these uh, uh, since uh, these things uh, got uh, tense. People, yes, there is certain kind of weariness, but it has real consequences for people within India and within Pakistan. The first consequence is that whatever little contact that we have with the, with India, kind of that's just goes. Like you know, whatever minimal trade we have. It's kind of, you know, nothing going. Sometimes India has some very good and cheap hospitals, like, you know, people who are very ill and can't afford to go to Europe, America, they would get visas and they would get treated there. That stops. Uh, in India, as we speak, like middle class Kashmiri professionals who are living in sort of big cities, not living in Kashmiris, they're being kind of hunted down. Many of them, who I know personally, have had to leave their homes because their kind of neighbors and other kind of radical groups are ganging up uh, uh, on them. And, uh, uh, and in Pakistan, if something sort of it, it escalates, you know, every Hindu, we have very few, everyone has to kind of, you know, just keeps reminding us that, oh, I'm Pakistani, I'm Pakistani, please don't think I'm an Indian. And similarly, Kashmiris have to keep thinking, oh, I, I, I didn't, I am not a militant, I didn't kill anybody, I've never killed anybody, I've never kind of, you know, done anything. So, so these are real consequences, like for real people, for, for artists, I think I was already telling you that there is a sort of some cultural exchange, like, you know, you get some work in India. I just had a book out four months ago, but things were so bad, like, I was like, I said, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, going. I used to go to India quite frequently, like, I used to practically live in, in lit fests, like, you know, sort of a few months of the year, and it was lovely, you know, sort of, you sell some books and you have like conversations with people and you know, you speak the same language and eat the same food and have grown up listening to the same songs. Uh, 
so that kind of goes out of the window there's like there's no uh, there's no chance that that will uh, that will come back uh, but that's. But you that, would be afraid if you went and talked about your book. You uh, a they would invite me, but I wouldn't get the visa. And even if they get the visa, I would be scared of like you know sort of uh, being surrounded. And I know that somebody will, you know, gang up on me and say that oh look they're killing our people, and then you're inviting them. It's just like it goes on all, all all the time, and you don't want to be. Uh, uh, but that's just like you know sort of my trivial little personal thing but imagine like a three years old who has like a hole in his heart and he can only be treated in India not happening uh, you know people kind of who do like small trading things they're kind of uh, uh, they're in trouble and people kind of in their own countries are being hunted down because you know sort of uh, uh, because you're talking about war 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 uh, so, so yeah, these these things have real uh, consequences for 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 real people. Misha Garbovich. Thank you. This is very impressive. I, I I have a whole series of interrelated questions, but I'll try to limit myself to two. So, um, first of all, as a novelist, mm -hmm. someone who has a, a lot of imagination. I know it must sound like a far-fetched question now, but what would need to happen for denuclearization of Pakistan and India? Just, you know, in, in your wildest imagination, what would be the preconditions? And maybe a related question, what is the role of the army in all of this? Because you talked about essentially the bomb in the national imagination. Mm -hmm. But what is specifically the role of the Pakistani army? Are they the main or they lobby? Control, or they control it. They, like control, they it. control it. Like no civilian prime minister would know like where it's kept, how it works, what's like you know uh, uh, how it's being uh, protected. No, uh, no prime minister in kind of last 15, 20 years has been kind of even allowed to visit some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, facilities. No so prime minister is allowed to visit. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. We kind of uh, so so that's kind of quite simple. They completely and absolutely they control it. There's kind of uh, they just tell us that don't worry about it. We have it and it's safe. So uh, sometimes I wonder if, even if they if they even have it or not. I mean, like what? How do how do you how do you know? I'm sure there are experts and they kind of know. They have ways of confirming it. But for a lot of time, I thought maybe it's just a hoax. Like you know, that they just uh, they've just made this facility and they kind of you know just fooling the world. Uh, I wish that was the case, though. It would be like you know. Uh, uh, so, and your first question, I mean, you tell me. I think America gives up, Rus Russia gives up. Like I think Pakistan and India would be the last ones to uh, go. Everybody will have to uh, denuclearize, and only then they might kind of you know start thinking about it. Right now, like. Uh, it is kind of, you're saying that it's kind of an old-fashioned kind of paranoia, but uh, there's a, just a big Indian movie out kind of celebrating the bomb, like, you know, how somebody working in a... Yeah, yeah so, so it's like the completely the, uh, the opposite. I've only read, like, a little bit or seen movies about, you know, sort of the, the horrors or, or the fear of, of the it. I, I've never seen, like, something kind of so celebratory about it. In Pakistan, when it's kind of discussed, it's like, you know, mm, we are it, like we have it. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, wait for the mic, please, because we're recording. Mm. Thank you so much mm. for such a beautiful and poignant talk. I also have two questions, um, okay. if I may. Mm -hmm. The first is, do you see a difference between how the next generation thinks about the bomb or mm. are you optimistic with how the next generation of Indians and Pakistanis will uh, think about the bomb mm. um, or is it you think so embedded in the sh sort of national pride that mm. it's very difficult to mm. to think mm. different for them to think differently. So mm -hmm. that's the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second is you mentioned that what happened this week in Kashmir, it's not necessarily the f first of many crises mm -hmm. between India and, and Pakistan. Um, do you see as a citizen um, what de-escalation mm -hmm. looks like? You talk about the beating of the drum mm -hmm. um, and you know that's 
happens so often mm -hmm. in uh, between you know those two countries. But mm -hmm. what does it mean to think about stopping it? I, that's something that I can't relate to, and I was mm -hmm. wondering if if uh, you could share your thoughts with us. So the first thing, uh, I mean that's a very interesting question, and I've kind of uh, I'm kind of. Uh, I saw that it was changing, like the, the, the new generation ha did not have the kind of fixation that we people who kind of, who kind of, who grew up towards the end of Cold War and kind of, you know, had read those literature or had heard those, those, those stories. So I was hoping that they did, they would not have uh, those uh, kind of obsessions. They kind of, you know, their, their ideas about the world, about India, Pakistan would be different and they were till like you know a few uh, years ago either they were indifferent or were not kind of invested in this uh, in this whole thing but uh, something <laughs> strange has happened that uh, uh, especially uh, uh, in India and to some extent in Pakistan as well I mean everybody's kind of raring to go to war like you know as if this is like you know uh, a sport, like, you know, whenever India and Pakistan play cricket, for example, like the whole kind of, you know, uh, the whole kind of, both countries kind of ab go absolutely nuts and crazy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, like people are kind of just uh, demanding the kind of language that I see from, from, from young people. I had like, you know, sort of a, a young journalist, I was just passing through a newsroom, it's like, you know, how will I become a war correspondent if there is no war? It's like, dude, come on, calm, calm down, <laughs> calm down. There are enough wars going on in the world. You can, you can send you somewhere. Uh, and from that to people kind of uh, basically uh, ganging up and hunting their own citizens because they think that they're sympathetic towards the other uh, country or they kind of. Uh, uh, and uh, with these, um, uh, and, and, and you would have thought that with this kind of, uh, with this social media, like people would like, you know, sort of get to know each other uh, a bit uh, more. But all you have to do is just to kind of say something uh, about, which is not like, which is anti-war, which kind of tries to calm things down. And the, the Twitter and Facebook, they just go, Berserk. So no, I, I, I was like till a few years ago, I was optimistic that, you know, these people were uh, kind of, you know, there were cultural exchanges, they were kind of, you know, getting to know each other, people were setting up things like, oh, okay, let's do a web link with an Indian school, those kinds of small things, but at least, you know, some trade was starting and people were saying that, okay, yeah, let's like, <laughs> eat, no problem eating Indian tomatoes, like, you know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> And yeah, no, these just yesterday they were destroying Indian tomatoes. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, you know, it's, uh, so that uh, is your uh, first question. That no, I, I I wish I was kind of uh, you know I, I had any if I had any hopes they're they're gone uh, now. They might come back like in a couple of weeks, but right now no. Uh, and your second question was sorry, you forgot. Yes. Yeah, de-escalation uh, in India, Pakistan only happens with the time. A few years have to go by. And since, uh, since Pakistan and India became nuclear powers, you would have thought that now they will feel confident enough that the other country is not going to invade me and take my nuclear. You would think, you know, as if I'm not an expert, but I would assume that that is the assumption that we know we both have the thing, so we, the fear should be less. Yes, but since, yeah, since, yeah, since 1999, like every two or three years, we kind of come on the, this verge of it. And there are incursions, there are strikes. India is probably right that some of the, the some of the attacks that happen in India are planned and, and sort of uh, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, similarly, kind of uh, India, you know, sort of uh, uh, does occasional things in, in parts of Pakistan. And you would think that, that when it de-escalates, it has a couple of times, like, you know, they don't even meet at minister level. 
like the, the sub minister, like, you know, sort of junior bureaucrat level, they will have, uh, uh, they will meet. Uh, but then like something really small would happen and they would uh, get, uh, they would get offended and then they will stop uh, uh, talking. Before they both became, went nuclear, nuclear, I think that the enmity is kind of intensified much. So yes, there is de-escalation in the sense that you're just waiting for the next thing to happen. Like it's not that, okay, you're talking, even talking that, okay, can we together stop that next thing from happening? No, both sides just sit and wait for the next, uh, next event to happen, either in India and Pakistan, and then you will kind of, you know, raise uh, the pitch. And, and I had like, you know, kind of forgotten that okay, this is what they keep doing, they will, you know, not actually do this. But we've kind of, uh, we've come close to, to this, and some of the people who are kind of sitting in Delhi and some of the people who kind of rule us, uh, some of them, like, are uh, not as certified as, as, as you mentioned Trump, but I'm sure, like, you know, they are, uh, they are not all there and they, completely believe that it's like, uh, it's fine, we have the bomb, like why did we make it if you're not going to use it? That logic is there, it's very prevalent. That why don't we just, why can't we just teach them uh, uh, a lesson? Uh, and same uh, with sort of uh, India. So, so e yeah, I mean, you could say that, okay, we are kind of old fashioned type people who kind of thought about the bomb, but, but the way these people kind of operate, the way these people, uh, uh, I mean, somebody who kind of plans a massacre, like you know, of of hundreds of millions, for example. Why do you think that he, they will be so sensible that they like cornered? If they're cornered, that they will not use that option. I mean, I I'm, I, I, I I don't have the answer, but I would assume that somebody who like very cold-blooded kind of way sort of plans a civilian. Uh, massacre just to score a point, not even like a big kind of strategic victory. If they are cornered, right, uh, why, why wouldn't they do it? You mentioned just a follow-up question. You said India's probably right that some of the attacks are planned. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the intention? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Pakistan's point. What are we getting out of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think sometimes there are uh, concrete uh, intentions, and sometimes when these uh, security apparatuses work, this is my own little experience, that really there's like no kind of central head. Some people were given a task like, you know, five years ago, that this is what you have to do. You have to train people and you have to kind of, you know, somehow uh, make them, motivate them, give them arms, and then kind of give them targets. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. Now the army, or some general somewhere, or prime minister might have kind of said that, oh, okay, no, we're not going to do this kind of thing anymore. But the thing with, uh, with, the, with these uh, people who kind of operate in these gray areas, I mean, they're not, like, you know, you don't send them an email and say, oh, okay, stop it today. Like, you know, they have their operators, they've trained them, you know, sort of, they, they have like you know their own, own uh, their own compulsions and their own uh, own logics. So I don't think that there's uh, mm, uh, uh, there's so much uh, uh, chaos uh, both in India and Pakistan security uh, apparatuses that that I I don't think even people who kind of command them uh, actually know all the time that what is uh, what is uh, what is going on. And sometimes they do it in their own country. It's been proven. Like you know India carried out a massacre in Kashmir when Clinton was visiting there. It's like recorded by Indian journalists. And similarly, Pakistan killed its own people and then blamed uh, it on, on, on India. I mean, they do it. I mean, I'm sure you know this. They, they, sure. It's secret agencies, they kind of do carry out these kind of operations. So yeah, its intentions are kind of, yeah, that's what our prime minister was saying. What are our intentions? Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would like to know what your intentions are. Robert, did I see your hand? Yes, Robert. Well, thank you, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, Pakistan is now the fourth largest nuclear power in the world, mm -hmm. um, and they're building extensively, they're building tactical nuclear weapons. Not, they're not 
building first strike city bullet busters. Mm -hmm. These are tactical nuclear weapons. They're, they're a whole different kettle of fish. They're very dangerous. Can mm -hmm. you explain for those of us who mm -hmm. aren't experts what the difference is? A tactical nuclear weapon is essentially deployed to the army to use in case they say the Indian, the Indian army makes an incursion, which is, which is what it's threatened to do in this mm -hmm. latest incident. Make an incursion into pa any, an inch into Pakistan is what the, uh, one of the former prime ministers said. An inch will, will take out India. Mm -hmm. And it gives the Pakistani army an option not to go all the way to, to pull out nuclear war. But, but to, as, we, as we did in Europe when we deployed these in the 50s, mm -hmm. to have, to have s um, theoretically at least, to have, have a deterrent against the Red Army invading without having to go to strategic nuclear war. So these things are very dangerous. Uh, they're perfectly, they're manufactured perfectly for the jihadi bomb, mm -hmm. which I worry about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one, th one, that's one question I wanted to just get an idea of if, if, if Pakistan is really aware of just how dangerous. In Los Alamos in, in, in 1945, it was called tickling the dragon, mm -hmm. where you came very, very close to criticality mm -hmm. for a split second. Indian Pakistan have been doing this thing, that this dance now for, for, for three decades. Mm -hmm. uh, China humiliated India in 1962 with their war, mm -hmm. so then the, China, the Indians mm -hmm. decided to get the bomb. Mm -hmm. Pakistan was humiliated in 1971, get the bomb. Mm -hmm. And then we have, and, and because it's so visceral, it's so part of the national identity now of both mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's extremely dangerous. If, if civilization began in the Indus Valley, it probably mm -hmm. will end there. If you see, if you see That's a, very, you if sound you, very reassuring. Thanks. If, <laughs> if you see a map, if you see a map of, of India and Pakistan, if the 50 cities go up on on both sides of the line, 50 cities, mm. the entire world, the entire globe will eventually, in 30 days, will be circled by by essentially a nuclear winter. Mm. And it won't be it won't be just India and Pakistan and the subcontinent. It will mm. be almost probably most of the earth will mm. probably sustain. Mm. Billions of people mm. are dead, if not mm. if not mm. the entire mm. human species. So, mm. so this is a, this is quite this is. I mean, aside from all of the hypocrisies and superpowers and all this mm. other all mm. these other things, uh, the fact is that this is probably the most dangerous confrontation on the planet right now. Mm. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to get you. Get yeah, I I've, I've I've heard the same thing that they they are building these tactical uh, weapons and. Uh, yeah, I think they know that they're very dangerous. That's why they're building them. <laughs> Otherwise, what would be the point? Uh, do they realize that uh, it won't end there? I, I don't know. I think they kind of do. They've been to kind of, you know, universities and they've done like, you know, their, uh, their, their PhDs and their kind of, uh, so I think they do know. Do they care if the world ends? I'm not too, sh I mean, there are moments when I'm not too sure about that. I mean, really. Who called the shots in Pakistan? Pakistan Army Chief. Always. Yeah, always. I mean, they have a guy who's head of the kind of the nuclear program, but he's just a kind of a, a military bureaucrat. It's, uh, it's, it's always going to be the, the, the Army Chief. Who, yeah. who is that guy? Uh, General Kamar Bajwa, but it doesn't really matter. It's an institution, so whosoever comes, whosoever is, has that role, it's, uh, I wish, like, you know, they keep thinking that, oh, like, I, I don't think personalities uh, matter, like, the, 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 the next one is usually crazier than the last one, that's how, that's how it kind of, uh, uh, that's how it, uh, that's how it has been, like, uh, so far. It might change, but uh, I'm not kind of, uh, uh, I'm not. Yeah, it, it, this is I. Mm, so tactical nuclear weapons, they they kind of the 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 myth is that they'll just like you know, just like they cover a small area, they'll just kill like you know few thousand people. It won't. Uh, no, no. Mm. Martin shot. I say thank you again mm -hmm. for your wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Just a little bit more information on mm. the notion of sovereignty, which seems to me uh, very important in your talk. Mm. On 
it seemed under threat mm. from various angles. Mm -hmm. You mentioned radicals or foreign terrorists mm. how they mm. going into Pakistan into hiding. Mm. You talk of US operatives mm. trying to kill them, mm. Indian incursions and mm. all that. And that makes me think that as far as I know, the Pakistani military has never ruled out first use. Mm -hmm. And one of the conditions for mm. first use mm. of nuclear weapons was infringement of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play out at all? I <laughs> That's, uh, that's that that as I was, was, was saying that 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 concept is kind of you know quite flexible. We can you know we can pick and dis we can pick and choose when our sovereignty is. For example, the last thing that happened between India and, and, and Pakistan, uh, India apparently carried out an incursion. They claimed it that they did surgical strikes within the borders of Pakistan. And uh, it was huge news. Pakistan, of course, totally denied it. Pakistan said it has happened. <laughs> so Indians, <laughs> Indians, to prove their point, <laughs> went ahead and made a movie about it, which just, <laughs> which has just uh, come out. So every kind of thing is is accompanied by like a movie and a song and a music video. Uh, so I'm not sure, like you know, they have, they have like their anthems when they when they want to do a, do a nuclear uh, thing. So I think so far this is how they have dealt with this, that they kind of deny that this incursion has happened. Like, you know, sort of with the, with the Osama bin Laden was like, you know, okay, it was like living there for five years, you didn't know. So you were basically, there are sometimes they claim mm, incompetence, that, you know, oh, we didn't know. And sometimes, you know, sort of people think that they are uh, that they are accomplices, right? And my own reading is that they are quite capable of being both. You know, yes, you you can be, you can hide someone, and then you know not be able to protect them. You know, that's both kind of you know you were accomplice and you were incompetent, which you kind of uh, 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 you got caught uh, 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 doing that. So, uh, so they they are quite uh, flexible uh, uh, about it uh, till the time they can spin it that no, we haven't been uh, humiliated. You know, sort of. Uh, I mean, they were at their lowest point when when Osama bin Laden incursion happened. I think it took them like you know, few weeks to bounce back, and they were back to their own, own glory as if nothing uh, had happened. I mean, that was the time when there was a national conversation that like, we pay so much for this country's security. They keep telling us that this is the best army in the world. First, this guy lives here, like right next door to where they live, and they don't know. And then somebody, like, you know, these helicopters cross your borders and you say, does not work? Like, what is going on? Like, what? But that conversation, Kind of, that was like one moment where civilians had kind of, you know, an upper hand of sorts in the sense that they called them in the parliament, which was like, I, I don't think it's happened in my lifetime, and asked them, so what's going on? Uh, but uh, it, it took them, you know, sort of uh, very little uh, time. The president then, President Zardari, he'd just become the president. He was new and brash, so he kind of announced that we will we'll work towards no first use policy. He was like asked to shut up and then he stayed sh shut up. Like he didn't, he didn't, he never repeated those, uh, those words uh, uh, after that. I wanna play devil's advocate for a second. Um, we had someone here last, uh, in late spring, so not quite a year ago, uh, reporting on the the, um, how the memory of the Korean War mm -hmm. affected policy in North Korea. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. I'm playing devil's advocate mm -hmm. here just for mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. who might have doubts about it. Um, it became suddenly quite plausible to me that someone from a country mm -hmm. 
that had been attacked and devastated, a mm -hmm. small country, mm -hmm. um, would, and he kept, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un used the example, of course, of what happened to Gaddafi mm -hmm. after he gave up his uh, nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. It suddenly became quite plausible mm -hmm. that um, a small, less protected, poor country mm -hmm. might actually think nuclear winter or no nuclear winter, mm -hmm. they will dominate me entirely mm -hmm. if I have no means of mm -hmm. defense. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to someone who made that argument? People make that uh, argument all I, the time. I yeah, assume, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's very difficult to argue not want to live with dignity? I mean, do you want to be at the at the mercy of like, you know, these 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 bullies? Do you kind of, you know, don't care about your people, your land? I mean the only <laughs> the only the only flaw in that argument is that you have no dignity. You have the warmth, you still are kind of running around asking people for loans. You so you don't care about your people, otherwise you would, you know, spend some money in educating them, you know, rather than, you know, sort of buying kind of more uh, 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 weapons. You have the bomb, you should kind of, you know, think of ways of kind of, you know, uh, being a bit more uh, 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 responsible. It hasn't kind of, you know, quite uh, worked, these kind of little cells here and that little cause here and that kind of, you know, forgotten liberation struggle there, you have not actually achieved, done anything for anybody. You haven't kind of, you were involved in Afghanistan, are they better off? No. You kind of uh, were set out to liberate Kashmiris, are they better off? They can't even live in their homes, right? So there should be some kind of, uh, you know, that argument, sometimes you have to agree with them. Yes, yes, okay, you made it, you have it, yes, it gives you kind of, you know, mm, uh, it's good for our egos, it kind of, you know, is practically you're right, otherwise somebody will run us over. Uh, so yes, you did that, but now where do we go from here? I mean... Of course, one argument you could make is that the United States, even though it's protected by two oceans mm -hmm. um, and a gigantic nuclear arsenal, is mm -hmm. completely capable of, um, you know, evoking fear and having citizens who are mm. terrified mm. of, you know, uh, Mexican the boss, or rather, the boss, yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> they have Salvadorian boss, women. Boss, yes, but yeah. yeah, but people do talk about, mm. uh, you know, there is a sense of fear, but that's mm. so clearly manipulated. Mm -hmm. Whereas it sounds like you're saying one important difference is, well, actually, every couple of years, there is a genuine fear as opposed mm -hmm. to one that's being constantly manipulated by uh, mm -hmm. some combination mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. president and the arms industry. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? I mean, do you see people trying to create fear or, or is it really more this question of dignity? I mean, it's an interesting difference. I think sometimes uh, 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 I, I I don't think it's 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 about really about dignity. I, I, I don't think at all. I mean that's my personal opinion. It's about it's about kind of consolidating the power that you already have within your own country, kind of perpetuating it, eliminating any kind of challenges to 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 the country. Now there is war hysteria because India is about to go into an election. And uh, they haven't, the, the government, which it was right wing, it kind of, you know, tried, it's tried everything, it's kind of tried to protect its cows, there have been kind of, you know, uh, vigilante attacks on kind of all kinds of poor farmers, uh, etc. And economically it hasn't done so well, so it's going into an election which is kind of very risky. So it helps to kind of, uh, mm, it helps in the election. And that's something that's changed in the last 20 years. Like in the 90s, when in India and Pakistan used to have elections, I mean, India wasn't even mentioned in Pakistani election campaigns. In India, Pakistan wasn't even mentioned. It was like all kind of domestic affairs. Mm -hmm. Now, last election happened in Pakistan, 
India was used. Now they are going to have an election in in uh, in India, so they have to have an incursion, some kind of surgical strike that they can set to music and then they can play in their election rallies. So I don't think it is about dignity uh, at all. I, I I don't even yeah. It's uh, it, it's 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 um, it's it's completely uh, manipulated. Dominic. I guess this is kind of related. I mean, I fear it's, it's more of a comment to see what you think of it than mm -hmm. a question. And it also may be um, an example of, uh, you know, looking for rational explanations for things, trying to contain dangers in my own mind. But when you were talking about these, uh, um, you know, these flare-ups every few years and tension, I mean, I thought, well, Maybe this is a way of, you know, the, the, you get the bomb with the hope that it promises you dignity mm -hmm. and it doesn't deliver. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through this ritualized process every few years mm -hmm. of, you know, having a sense of real fear, real, th real threat, then to fall back on the bomb to create the dignity <laughs> that it wasn't able yes. to, to deliver yeah. on earlier, yes. sort of just... So that was kind of my, my hopeful interpretation, that it was more of a, of a pageantry of a search for dignity um, that needed to be repeated on a regular basis because it never actually ever comes in the way you, you hope it to happen. I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I, that, that's, I think that's exactly probably uh, what happens. Uh, I'm not too optimistic about the fact that it has no kind of, you know, it's not going to happen. Like, you know, it'll just kind of die down. Uh, because, uh, as I said, last uh, 19, 20 years since I think they both went nuclear. I mean, every flare up, uh, every attack is worse than the, the last one. The, the consequences that, that kind of uh, are uh, there for, for local populations and for both kind of, you know, across the border, they kind of last much longer. Like, you know, first there would be a flare up, like, you know, they would stop talking, stop flights, stop like for six months. Uh, now it goes on for years and uh, it kind of wades into kind of, uh, sort of really silly things that, you know, sort of delete the all Pakistani sort of musics, like songs from Indian websites. Like, so it kind of goes into like, you know, sort of really bizarre. And, uh, and yes, you're right, it may be peasantry, but I think uh, people now suffer more and more every time that it happens. And they suffer for uh, longer and and going back to normal, as you were saying, that after that, like after this periodic thing, things go back to normal. They actually, for some people, uh, for a lot of people, they don't. I mean, during this week, people who have had to leave their homes in Delhi or Bangalore or wherever, I mean, my fear is that many of them won't be able to go back to their homes. They'll have to retreat into like some Muslim ghetto. They'll have to kind of, you know, uh, think about uh, and. Uh, you know, Kashmir's probably had the worst last year. I don't know how many hundreds of uh, kids, young people, teenagers have been actually uh, uh, blinded. It's a small place. It's not like a huge... Uh, mm. So, and this, after this, you know, all the previous brutality is justified and, you know, sort of, they have the sanction to kind of do uh, do more. So, uh, so yes, they... they, they do it like because it kind of just reminds them that see oh, our bomb protected us again. Uh, but I, I, I think there are lots of people who kind of have to live with this with serious uh, serious consequences which can have affect their their lives, their homes, their families. Have I missed anyone? Yes, sir. I'm Daniel Bosinius. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I think, I'm not sure whether everyone 
is aware of it, but I think these flare-ups, they are not just psychological, but I mean, there are these terror attacks and India blames Pakistan, justifiably or not. I mean, there was this major terror attack on the Indian parliament yes. about the same time as, it was pretty much about the same time as 9-11. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it, not many people in, in the West followed it so much because, uh, I mean, everyone was following 9-11. There was a terror attack in Mumbai and there was um, like this, re this recent terror attack. And um, I'm not judging it, I mean, but India blames Pakistan for it. And um, you might say that because both sides have nuclear wep weapons, they can't, have, they can't go to war. Mm -hmm. and, but I I Pakistan is dissatisfied with India's policy of a Kashmir. And so maybe the weapon of choice might be terror. Mm -hmm. This is just theoretical. And then I two other questions. Um, you mentioned in your talk that um, Western think tanks, every few months they produce another paper, are Pakistani nuclear weapons, are they safe or are they not safe? Um, I, I've read in, I think in, in, in German foreign policy magazines in the years following 9-11, there was speculation whether the Pakistan, Pakistani nuclear arsenal had somehow been secretly put under US control. I mean, do we have to say anything to, to, to about it? And also with the Middle East and Iran and Saudi, I mean, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, as I understand, they are politically closely related, uh, or there are close relations between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And sometimes there are speculations that if Iran might someday get closer to the bomb than it's now, that Saudi Arabia, because it's a sponsor of Pakistan, might just be able to buy ready-made bombs from Pakistan off the shelf. I mean, do you have to say anything to it? Yeah, I have heard this last one that, you know, sort of, uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll just give it to her, we'll rent it out to Saudi Arabia. Like, that's, I, I keep hearing, uh, uh, I have heard uh, that being uh, talked about in Pakistan. I don't know anybody who kind of works in the sort of nuclear facility, who studies it, so I, I, I don't know. But you're right, I have heard uh, these rumors, I've also heard that Saudi so has kind of, you know, uh, its own aspirations, and, and, and now the latest, uh, I think, the thing is heard that actually Trump wouldn't mind if they kind of build their own or bought from us oh. or from somebody. Okay. Uh, that is the latest. I just heard like yeah. a rumor because the Saudi prince was in Pakistan. They were kind of, you know, uh, having a. Uh, yes, Pakistan does use. Uh, mm, has used uh, 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 terrorists uh, uh, as weapon against uh, Kashmir for a very, very uh, uh, long time. Uh, India is uh, kind of new to the game. Pakistan blames that there was a big massacre in a school in Pakistan where 150 kids were massacred. That India was uh, uh, was behind that. Uh, it is also true that India also <laughs> uses terror against its own people. It is also true that Pakistan uses terror against its own uh, own people. So yes, those things are kind of uh, all uh, all there, and uh, these flare up uh, mm, are uh, sometimes genuine, but sometimes I think just I have no way of knowing. Sometimes just looking at the timing, looking at the kind of you know the way you kind of uh, ramp up the. Uh, of the noise where kind of you want to take it and also there is uh, has been no since the this last government kind of uh, uh, came and there's been no there have been offers from Pakistan side to start talking again and I have no idea if there is any other solution if you say you know we normally talk I mean how where will this? Uh, where will this? Uh, uh, this go? So I, I, I think they're kind of both stuck in this kind of um, thing, and there's uh, no kind of uh, getting out of it. You work in the magazine. You probably have but better sources than I do. That who actually controls uh, it or not? But but occasionally they do kind of give them reassurances or show them their plans about like you know how it is safe and how it's like, you know, as safe as, as it, as it uh, 
as it should be, that it's kind of locked up and they have the key. Nobody can, nobody will come and take it. Yeah. Have I missed anyone who would like to question or comment? Then um, I'd like you to join me in thanking Mohammed for a um, moving and disturbing <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thank you.